So it's, it's on Monday evening. Uh, the, the location and the times are posted on the course website. Yeah, there's no tutorials on Monday the, in the morning or afternoon for groups A and B, and it only covers the economic section. So the safety of the community starting on now is not included in this one. It's only a few minutes. And it will be two hours in duration. Um, so that's that. And then the other administrative issue is regarding the self-directed learning project. So I posted a memo on the course website on that yesterday. Just a little bit about the STL project then. Um, it's been coming up over and over in the class verbally. So what's in the memo there really isn't anything new. You've heard it from me before just in the class, but now you have been writing. Uh, the main aim of the memo is to point out the fact that the STL project has two deliverables. There's the written project and a uh, presentation that you make to the class for 15 minutes for the group. Uh, those presentation materials are then available to the class and will be part of the final exam for everyone. The other, uh, there's a minor graded component in the STL and that's the meeting you have with us. It's a very minor amount of grading uh, relative to the project and the, the written report and the presentation. But the meeting then, which are next week, are, uh, there's a very minor scope for the meeting. We need to make sure that your project area of coverage is sufficient for this uh, topic that you've chosen and to discuss what you plan to look at in your um, in your written report and in your class presentation. So there's four major areas in this course. There's the economics, there's the safety, there's operability, and there's troubleshooting. So your, your area that you choose, say for example, wastewater or a petroleum subsection of petroleum refinery, um, may be able to focus more heavily on one of those sections than the other. If you chose a nuclear reactor, for example, the safety section would be quite important. Uh, and then the economics less so because to cost a nuclear reactor, there's no reliable guide information. So I wouldn't expect you to focus on the economics section. So the meeting is a purely an opportunity for myself and for the TA, depending on which groups you're in to just make sure that the balance that you strike in your report is okay. Um, so I got some negative comments saying that the feedback was received too late and was useless, um, etc. Okay, yes, it was a little late, but it's not penalizing. The meetings were scheduled for next week. Uh, there's no more that you could have done in preparation for the meeting, whether you heard the feedback yesterday or two weeks prior. Um, because the meeting scope, as I said, is purely for you to identify what your focus areas are. Is it troubleshooting, mobility, <coughs> economics, or safety, or two or three of those combinations. And for me to uh, see that you've allocated the work amongst your group members equitably. So it's not fair to allocate a small piece of work to one person, say economics, but then other people get to do less. So that sort of stuff is not something that uh, is prepared, um, other than maybe having a, minor, a group meeting ahead of time and allocating the work amongst your group members and talking about the scope of your, your project. So come to the meeting with a flow sheet of your, of your plants that you, or of the area of your plant that you've identified uh, with a good understanding of the physical principles in that flow sheet. Presumably that's why you chose that topic is because you, your group has an interest in it and has some prior understanding of that, of that flow sheet. And then it's a, it's a 45 minute discussion with Alicia and myself to, to, to narrow down those issues. In terms of timing, um, I'm available in the afternoons all the way up to about 8 p.m. So I know that some groups are not uh, able to coordinate their times. But that's my time slots. I, I'm going to meet with Alicia and find out what her time, time slots are. So group Bs that are meeting with me, uh, you can schedule meetings anytime in the afternoon up to as late as 8 p.m. Um, and then uh, we can put those in from Tuesday to Friday next week. Any, any questions on that? Okay, so let's just uh, then resume where we left off last class. We finished off speaking about flaring after we uh, relieved material, we used to flare it. And we had uh, some interesting discussion there on showing what these flare units look like and how they're monitored. Uh, this journal publication <coughs> Brief, six pages, it's very readable, there's no technical um, background that you require to understand it, and I highly recommend you, you read it a bit more to understand, for example, why we actually inject steam into a flame to encourage that flame to burn more cleanly. It's 
um, seems a bit counterintuitive to use water injection in there, but it actually it does assist. Um, so I think things along those nature are important to understand. Let's just finish off the relief topic then uh, before we move on to hazard marketability studies. The main issues with the relief system is obviously sizing it so that it can handle the flow that's required under the worst case conditions. That's the primary, um, one, one of the primary requirements. And then the other primary requirement is that it will relieve at the needed or required pressure. So we will size that relief valve to handle the maximum flow and we'll set the relief valve to handle the desired pressure. So we select either our diaphragm burst valve to burst at a, at a minimum pressure or the, um, the other safety relief valve will set the tension in the spring so that it will open at the required pressure. <coughs> we, uh, Dr. Marlon's covered the advantages and disadvantages of both and uh, sometimes we can put them in series and put them in the calculations. Let's just take a look at a bit of the calculations required here, uh, not in depth by any means, but for some simple cases, the relief flow, if we've got a, a completely filled system over here, Remember, this is why we're applying relief, is when we have a closed system and um, it, we, we need to now relieve it. In this case, if it's completely liquid or vapor, the flow rate out today is simply whatever is uh, coming in because it, that system is entirely closed. For systems that there happen to be two phases, so here we've got liquid and a gas phase above it, and there's heat input, for example, from a fire or from that heat around it, and when that Q, that heat input gets too high, we need to apply relief. And what's the expected flow out? It's a function of the heat of vaporization, um, how much heat is being consumed by boiling liquid to gas. And then VG and VL refer to the specific uh, volume of the liquid or gas. That's essentially just the inverse of the density of the two. Um, and then Q is the amount of heat being added. Then the final one is if you've got a liquid fill system and there's no phase change, uh, but you've got external heat things provided there, there's radiation, heat transfer, convection heat transfer, then you would need to relieve according to that, that flow rate there, which is dependent on the heat capacity of the material. So if there's no phase change, you're only heating up the material, then there's a phase change occurring. I'm uh, sorry, there's no phase change occurring, so it's only the heat capacity that's important. If there is a phase change occurring, you're going to remove heat. Uh, from that system naturally by boiling it, so that's the heat vaporization. Um, other key issues regarding relief here, yeah, as we said, it needs to take into account the maximum flow under the worst conditions. So, for example, here in the distillation column, we're looking at relieving at the top of the column. The worst case that could occur is when you're sending only feed to the column in its vapor form. So all of that's going right up. When you're maximizing that reboiler duty, when you're basically essentially boiling all your liquid up, and you've lost complete condensation. So essentially you're just putting the entire vapor stream up into this column from all, all the inputs. So pure vapor here, pure vapor here, pure vapor coming in. So all of that pressure buildup in the column is your worst case scenario. Um, and so we size our relief valve to handle that situation. Um, on, a, on a heat exchanger there as well, you would provide relief. Uh, Dr. Marlin had spoke about that in the class. Uh, so if one of those valves had closed on that heat exchanger, we would then build up the pressure, especially on the shell side. Uh, if there's a fire on the side, outside the shell, and it's heating up that fluid, but there's nowhere for it to go, it's going to start to vaporize and we need to, to relieve it. So here, for example, is um, it's not a very clear photo, but it's uh, the water heat in my basement. It's the same idea, it's a heat exchanger. We're providing natural gas heat in here at the bottom, boiling that liquid. Normally, that is on off control and, it, and it's stable and it works very well. But if there was a fire in my house, this system, all the valves are closed. So now I essentially have a closed tank like this. So here's the fire providing Q, there's liquid and gas. That flow rate out of that, that tank needs to be sized so that it can handle it. So here's the relief. It's a small pipe about half inch diameter and it's bent it down to the ground. 
Uh, I've got a concrete basement, so I don't care if, if I get water on the floor in there. But if you had this, as some people do, in a roof, uh, you would want that water to be appropriately taken care of. Um, if you have a fire in your house, also, though, you may not really care about minor leakage like that. But you want that pipe to be sized, this valve to be appropriately sized, so that this tank doesn't just explode and become a projectile. Right? So you want that relief valve to be opened wide enough to, to, to get that total flow out <coughs> of and, and stay open for as long as it needs to, to relieve the pressure. So same idea with the heat exchanger. Uh, you want your shelf side uh, to be able to be relieved if you have a fire close by to your heat exchanger, which is common in petrochemical area. We have our heat exchangers right there in between the equipment. So if we had to have a fire, we don't want that heat exchanger to become a projectile. Okay, so how do we size those relief valves? Once we know the flow, we anticipate so this is our maximum flow. We use the, the, the standard equations for flow through an orifice that you would have seen in your fluid flow course. Um, we just simply rearrange it for the cross-sectional area there and make sure that um, we oversize it a bit. So we have some correction factors here in the denominator to, to make sure that we get that, that, that valve over, oversized. So the, the purpose of this course isn't for us to go through these and apply these calculations, but for us to recognize that this is, there is a procedure to do it. And uh, the textbook that Dr. Marlon recommended, uh, Kral and Robar, um, they go through these equations and give a number of, of case studies for for using them. So if this is something that you will use in the future. This is an excellent reference to to go to, and it's mentioned in Dr. Marlon's notes as well. Um, the other. The other issue here um, is essentially what I just said. So we take that equation, we rearrange for area. Um, the, but the main issue that I want to talk about here is, and this can't be stressed too, too, too much, is that two-phase flow almost, not almost always, but very often does exist in relieving. So you may expect your relief to only be gas or only be liquid phase. But in many cases, uh, we've seen that when you may have a liquid, that when you relieve it, you actually get liquid and gas to, uh, coming out of that relief valve. And then your area required for relief is much greater than you incorrectly calculated, assuming only a single phase. So there are methods to handle uh, calculations for two-phase flow, and should always be considered as a, as an, as a possibility that could, could exist. And so you would size for the expectation of two-phase flow, and you would be essentially oversizing the relief valve, which is desirable in terms of its area. And to acquire this information um, on, say, heat of vaporizations that you would need to size those valves, we, there are small laboratory-sized experimental equipment to do that. So small adiabatic reactors to simulate what runaway reactions would, would look like how much heat would be released so that we can get the necessary parameters to then plug into those equations. So we do it on a smaller scale where there's very little hazard and we can, we can appropriately size these units. So needless to say, this is a specialty topic uh, that we wouldn't have a person, even myself, I would be totally inexperienced and wouldn't consider myself qualified to size one of these valves. If I was in a company and, and looking at this, we would certainly hire some outside expert who's very comfortable and serious with this job size. Because this is not something we want to to say for It's the same, um, same idea coming back to the whole engineering ethics that Dr. Marlon mentioned in that very first case study where the company in Flipsborough gave the job to size the valve, or to, to put a pipe bypass around the reactor to the person who was inexperienced and not qualified to do that. In the same way, I wouldn't expect you or myself to, uh, to do this. Uh, we would always hire outside people who are comfortable and know exactly how to size these, these safety systems. Okay, so for that, for that reason also is why we don't go into it in this, in this class. And just the, the time duration to do that would be um, so we don't go into the details for it, other than to mention it is important. Okay, so that's uh, that covers the topic of pressure relief.
and uh, then Dr. Marlin's section as well on the basic control hierarchy, the basic control systems, the alarms, the safety interlocks, and uh, then the loop following the component. So it's covered essentially here the safety hierarchy. The next section that we'll uh, be looking at is that on hazards and risks and hazard and out hazard studies. So um, so this is in, in another set of notes that we have. Well, in your slides, it will just continue straight on. Um, so in terms of your slides, it would look like this. And it's on page, page 27, if you're looking for it. So page 27, there's this little, little guy looking at the forms in the middle of the page. So hazard analysis and, and hazard and operability studies is, is a critical part of designing a new process or if we're redesigning a process or modifying a process we come back and do a hazard and operability study. What we talked about first here are checklists and relative ranking. These would be helpful uh, when working on a new process. And then hazard and operability studies would also cover uh, new processes as well for redesigning existing. Process. So, <laughs> people often complain that hazard and operability studies are a waste of time. I've heard people refer to them exactly in those terms as a waste of time. They are expensive, that, that is true. They take a lot of time, that is true. I wouldn't consider them a waste of time. In fact, um, as Dr. Martin said, even if you consider the value of a human life to be zero dollars, which would be objectionable for most of you, I assume. If you consider the value of a human life to be zero dollars, still the value of the cost of an accident to your plant, lost production, and time delays uh, are high. So a hazard and operability study is got two parts to identify hazards and to and to, um, to counteract them. But then there's also the operability side which is, we'll get to that part of the course next, but the operability identification or identifying sources that will impede operability is also an important part because this allows us to operate our process in a more continual manner without shutdowns. So keeping our level of our number of hours per year up, the operability side is part of a hazard and operability study. So it's not purely just looking at things that can go catastrophically wrong and kill people or injure them, but we're also looking at how to maximize our throughput through our process. So it, it, is, it has its engineering value, um, even though the safety slide may be totally irrelevant to you in the model. But the other thing to remember is, sure this looks a little bit funny, but if you were walking around in any chemical plant that you were not responsible for building or designing, which would be most times that you walk around in any chemical plant. If you're standing next to a distillation column or say the reactor that we, for example, the group that went to Biotech the other week with me, we were standing right next to a reactor that's burning butane in oxygen. Would you want to assume that those engineers had done the hazard and operability study thoroughly? You absolutely do. So it's not just for your own interests, it's for other people also that are going to be in the environment and the neighborhood around your plants that we do this for. Um, so let's just take a look at, at this topic. It is important for that reason. And it has got a few terms that we need to be fairly precise about. The first is the definition of a hazard. So here the hazard is introducing the potential for an unsafe condition. Okay, so this would be something like the burner on your stove at home. Is the burner, whether it's gas or electric, is that a hazard? Yeah. Is the burner a hazard? Yeah. Does it have the potential for unsafe condition? Yeah. Okay. So here I would say the burner itself is not a hazard, but if the burner is on, it is a hazard. <laughs> Hasn't introduced the potential. So, be 
lean on is introducing the potential for an unsafe accident or unsafe condition. The burden just being present is not unsafe. Okay, it's a bit of a triviality, but it's, it's important when we come to hazard, when we work with these terms that they are very precise meanings. So a heat exchanger by itself, sitting there idle, is not a hazard, but being on and having fluid flowing through it at higher temperatures and pressures is potentially a hazard, especially if those fluid flows and temperatures are higher than the normal design of the, of the unit. The risk, risk is a little bit of a different term, and I'll talk about that for a minute. There isn't too much here on the slides about it, but um, it's, a, it's an intuitive concept that we have. So risk is a function of two things. One is the probability of some event occurring multiplied by the magnitude of its effect. The risk of flying in an aircraft is pretty minimal because the probability of a catastrophic failure is very, very low. But when an accident does happen, we tend to kill everyone in the plane. How do you define the probability of an accident based on history? Yes. <laughs> Number of incidents per year, and for an aircraft, that would be extremely. But what about something that's new? Something new? Something new would be much harder to quantify. We'll talk about that. So if in those unknowns, then your probability is unknown. You'd say, well, let's go on the side of and consider it high, and so you've got a high risk for an unknown process. So risk is an intuitive uh, concept that we that we deal with. And one way that we, we tend to work with it, given those, those two definitions of, uh, sorry, the two terms in it, probability and magnitude, we'll tend to work with it as follows. We'll say, if I plot probability here, and we'll just simply call it low, medium, and high probability, and then here's magnitude, and we will use also just low, low severity or uh, magnitude or severity, low, medium, and high. We tend to create um, these nine nine grids. Okay, so an event here with high severity and high probability of occurrence, that's got an extremely high risk. So the first part of risk is firstly just to identify, identify the risk. So that's, uh, we can easily do that by evaluating the probability of the occurrence and the magnitude of, or the severity of the effect. So identifying risk is not hard. Uh, we, can, we can do that. But then there's two ways we can deal with this. One is to eliminate, <coughs> well, there's three ways to deal with it. One way is to eliminate the risk. So simply remove that probability down to zero or the severity of it down to zero by changing to a totally new design, for example, or modifying the design. One way, another way is to control, control for it, so put safety systems around it to prevent it from reaching a point where that, that event occurs. And the other way to do it simply is to finance your risk. So you buy insurance. Or you set money aside for that event. So there may be a risk of a lawsuit in your company. You either buy insurance for it, or you set money from a sales to the site every year to finance a lawsuit in the future. <coughs> Sorry, terrible. No, but you do it for your house, right? So I buy insurance, buy insurance for my house. So we do that for our cars, for our houses. A standard way of dealing with risk is to finance. So what we, what we tend to find, though, is that when we've got high risk and high probability, anywhere sort of in this region over here, we'll tend to eliminate that risk if possible. So on this side of the line, we'll tend to eliminate it. We really don't want these high probability and high severity events from occurring. In this middle region, we'll tend to control the risk. So, 
at the, at, in this case of very high probability of occurrence, but with low magnitude. So this would be, for example, a motor coupling breaking up and, and shooting metal fragments around. It, it does occur quite frequently, and this, but the severity of it can be, uh, can be fairly low. So what we need to do is control it by building a housing around the motor so we can contain those metal fragments should that event occur. So at the low end, you would control it. At this end, you would finance it to buy insurance for it. So insurance is appropriate when you've got a high severity, my house going up, down is very high severity. I lose all my money that I put into it if I didn't have insurance. But the probability of that occurring is pretty low. Though my neighbor smokes, so maybe my probability is a little higher. And then in this lower area, well, we simply accept it. This is us getting onto trains, airplanes, driving cars, walking out on the streets every day. We simply deal with that. Okay, so, so those are standard ways of dealing with risk. So it's important to understand this because when we get to hazard and operability studies, every time we identify a major hazard, we also look at the consequences of it. And then once we've identified the consequences, we develop an action to mitigate the consequences. But that level of action we take is going to be directly proportional to the risk of that hazard occurring. So coming back to leaving a burner on in my house, that probability of me doing that is pretty low. And so I may not do anything special about it. But risk uh, events that occur fairly frequently, um, I would certainly want to do something about it. So you'll see when we have, once we've identified a hazard and it's catastrophic effect, depending on the, the, the effect of that hazard, we may uh, take some sort of action. The way we'll take action is depending where we are in this grid. So the type of action we'll take, uh, whether we choose to eliminate that hazard, whether we choose to control the hazard, buy insurance for it, or simply accept that hazard, uh, would depend then on the, the outcome of that. So that's hazards, then risks. An incident is an undesirable event that causes or produces a potential for that accident. So the hazard is having the burner on in my house. The incident is me putting napkins or, or a drying cloth near the burner, or putting bacon on the stove and walking away from it and letting the fat burn. So that's the incident. It may not have led to the house burning down, which is what happened to my aunt, how she burned her kitchen down with my cooking bacon and walking away. So she got a new kitchen, still lived to see the new kitchen, but that's the incident, that's the near miss, is that you've got your hazard having the burner on, the incident is putting your hand close to it, or putting paper towels nearby to catch fire. The accident then is when that near miss escalates up into something worse. Cause damage to the environment, property, kill people, um, or neighbors, and so on. When you're choosing, um, I guess, the instance that you're thinking of being a big principal risk assessment, do you choose like, the worst possible incident, giving you like, lower probability of the worst incident, or would you choose a mid range incident? Okay, good question. So whether we choose low range or mid range incidents, we'll see that in fact when we follow our hazard procedure, we, we evaluate all of them. So all possibilities are looked at. So we will consider two when the flow is too low into our process, or the flow is too high, and we'll list all the potential consequences, and for every consequence, we'll see what the potential what the risk is. So then the low risk one we may choose to just do nothing about. But the high risk consequences that cause catastrophic damage, um, and, and there may be frequent probability of that occurring, that we definitely want to eliminate that. So that, that's, that's where we're heading to. Okay, so uh, one way to get your list of hazards is to use experts. And these experts have compiled checklists which are freely available. Um, some are not freely available, but some are from the AICAG and other safety agencies. They will, you can buy or obtain these lists of hazards from previous studies. Um, but you would need to tailor them to your situation. 
especially if it's something that's clearly non unique. Mm -hmm. This is very good if you're just starting off. Um, it helps you uh, cover all your bases that you, and especially areas that you may not have thought of as being risky um, or being a hazard at all. But as I said here, it doesn't address a new process or unfamiliar equipment. And often the biggest drawback about these checklists and even the biggest drawback about some safety experts is that the events that occur very infrequently but then have high consequences, they're not covered in those checklists because they're by their nature they're not well known or well publicized. There's also checklists that say what if. So you can purchase uh, tech checklists or you can find checklists that say what if temperature was too high, what if flow was too high, what would be the likely consequences. These are just sentences or questions then that would trigger you to ask and identify appropriate hazards. Okay, so that's the first step is to go through go through checklists. And these can be done very early on um, before you even have a design of any level of detail, you can go through these checklists to make sure that you're not moving into an unsafe design. It still gives you a chance to fix up it, fix up the design or choose an alternative before it escalates into a problem. And the, and the thinking there is, is quite simple, is as follows. If we look at, at uh, almost all projects that happen in the chemical industry, or, or most, most projects in fact, will follow this trajectory where if we look at uh, the dollars spent over time, what shape does that have, that curve? So if here is my maximum dollars, the total project cost at the end. <clears throat> what does that spend look like over the time? Is it a linear graph? Any other shape? Parabolic? Logarithmic? Exponential? Probably the expected decay part of us is that we can overcome. So this is this is the, the total dollar spent. So it's going to be oh, sorry, total dollar spent. Total dollar spent. So it would probably be five. Decline, but how? Actually, yeah, that's that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> total dollars, yeah, we can reach the maximum. Okay, so now in fact, <coughs> what most projects follow is a trajectory <laughs> and the curvature of that S is higher or lower. So, for example, the project I did in black, so uh, the biggest chunk of money was the equipment itself. So, when we paid the vendor, essentially, we, we did this. We spent almost no money at the beginning of the flight to go see the equipment, travel, hotel, etc., etc. Then we paid the guy, and then we had a few minor installation fees. But most projects go more S shaped. And this is the period of time you want to do that hazard study. And you want to go through your checklist there, because that gives you any time, it gives you a chance to fix up any of the design issues. It's far more expensive to realize that at this point in time, and the material of construction that you've chosen is going to be prone to corrosion and lead to problems under high temperature conditions, which you may not have anticipated. This, at this time, you've already ordered the equipment. The vendors probably already started fabricating it for you. You're going to pay big dollars in penalties to uh, change the material of construction. But what's happened at some companies, they simply just they take that equipment, but then they reorder the correct one afterwards. They're just simply unable to change. So here you want to do your, your, your analysis for hazards and go through these checklists early, early on. You obviously, let me just update this, you don't want to do it near the beginning of the project. Because at this particular point in time, you're still choosing between alternative designs. You haven't got a detailed flow sheet yet. You may not have done your natural energy balances you'll see that you can't really do a hazard and operability study without that information. So there is a middle ground to strike. It's, not, it's definitely not the first thing that you do. Um, you do need some fairly detailed information to, to, to do the hazard and operability study. Okay, so relative ranking then is, an, is, a, is one of these tools to use early on. 
Um, so early evaluations of, of completing a project is also used by insurance companies to judge um, what, where, what their premium should be. So it's a very well-defined procedure and tables. We'll actually go through a, a one over here. Um, the key is that you can do this on your own. So the hazard and operability study we'll see later, that's a group of people, and you must have a team of people to do that effectively. This, going through relative ranking and through these checklists, this is something that whether I do it or you do it or someone else in the class does it, we should all get to roughly the same ranking independent of each other. Okay? Whereas hazard and operability studies, the hazards that I identify will be very different to someone else depending on their background and their experience. So the hazards will all, always be divergent if they were done individually. But relative ranking is there's a, a set procedure, um, there's a bit of judgment and a bit of leeway, but you should generally come up with the same ranking. And what it does with this, there's three indexes available. We'll just look at one, it's called the Dow Fire and Explosion Index. Uh, you can get this index in a, through ASCG, it's also available in the library. And it's, there's a simple ranking as follows. If your ranking for your area of the flow sheet that you're considering is between 1 to 60, your hazard is considered light. And then there's six, 61 to 96, 97 to 127 is intermediate, and then there's heavy and severe at the end there. So what we'll do is we'll take our flow sheet and divide it up into regions that coherently work together. So I'll, I'll show you an example in a minute. And then we'll perform the ranking for that region of the flow sheet. And then that, that, that gets us a sense of what the level of hazard is in that area of the flow sheet. If the hazards are unacceptably high, we can quite easily interchange the technology in that region of the flow sheet with some alternative. We don't have to redo the entire flow sheet, just the region that we consider to be high hazard. So that's the one reason why we break up our flow sheet. We don't do the whole thing together because it's unhelpful to say your entire plant is hazardous. Um, it's far more helpful to say, well, no, the part where you're burning butane with air, that's the hazardous part. But then once you've got the products of those combustion and you're dealing with the downstream separations, then that, that part's not, not so hazardous. So you may want to then just look at changing out the part of the process that is hazardous. <laughs> Once you have that um, information, then you can also go ahead, as, as we mentioned earlier, and estimate, well, even for a hazardous process, what is my anticipated loss going to be in dollars per accident? What is my business interruption going to be in a number of days? And then you can decide, well, should I buy insurance for it? Should I try to control it? Should I change out my bed? So let's take a look here at Bartek. Uh, company in Stony Creek, they make the lake and hydride, and they take butane from liquid form, vaporize it, and burn it with air. So we're only going to look at the, uh, the part where butane is vaporized. We're not going to look at where butane is reacted, um, and we're not going to look at butane storage either. So let's, let's show that here. If we look at the flow sheet, there's liquid butane stored in tanks. So this is delivered. Uh, by my tank every day and stored in liquid form. We're only going to consider the part where we're pumping out that liquid from the storage tank at a certain flow. We're taking it through a heat exchanger and heating it up with steam. Here's our steam. We're considering the part from this point onwards where we're heating out that new table in liquid form and vaporizing it. The condensate. This vapor stream of butane comes through, there's an analyzer here to, to monitor the percentage of butane. And what we're doing is we're combining it with air. So atmospheric air is taken in, compressed at a certain flow rate F4. So this does flow rate F4 and F2 are carefully ratio controlled. So we're measuring here the percentage butane in the air. We don't want to exceed the explosive limit. There is a very, there's a very, there's a very tight upper limit there that we want to stay just below, so we can avoid that explosive air from igniting. So this is the region of the flow sheet we're considering and, and evaluating the hazards for. If we find this part to be hazardous, we can look at some alternatives to mitigate that hazard. We're not considering the reactor part. 
this part, if we would do a separate analysis of this, and if we found that to be hazardous, we could look at alternatives over there. So the, the approach is very straightforward. We, um, we use this dial index procedure. And this is in the notes, so it's not too visible up here on the slides. But essentially, we, we always start with a base factor of 1.0 if the temperature is greater than 140 degrees. So in our case, that is true. It's not an exothermic reaction, so we put a zero over there, we score a zero. Remember, we're not looking at the reactor. We're only looking at vaporizing liquid butane to vapor and combining hot air with it, essentially. The reaction, that exothermic reaction takes place here. This is where you're burning butane. Absolutely, that's going to uh, be an exothermic reaction, but that's not the part we're considering. So exothermic reaction zero, endothermic reaction, we're not handling material, uh, no enclosed units, um, and we proceed to go down through the list, and we get a score here of F1 as a value of one. Then we come to toxic materials, there's no toxic materials here, so there, that part we don't score anything for. We keep going, there's operation near a flammable range, tank farms, upsets, always in the flammable range, Yes, we are in a, in a flammable range, there's no dust, there's pressure. So that pressure constant, you look up on a figure that's given in the Dow handbook. So Dr. Marlin said, yeah, figure two, page 22, and you would score a value of 0.25. This is why we say that an end of, any independent engineer should come up with the same scoring, because it's a very straightforward checkbox procedure that you're looking up. Uh, quantity of flammable material scores a, a 0.1 based on another um, figure that's looked at in this index. The other, other non-zeros here are leakage. There is a potential for leakage up here in the pumps. So when we're pumping this liquid butane, there is potential for leakage to occur over there. So we would score a, a 0.1. And we keep going and add, add up the numbers, and then finally we, there's a product of F1 and F2. So we calculate F2 from these factors down over here. That scores a 2.75. F1 was scored earlier up here as 1. So then the product of the two gets us a score of 57.8. Which, if we then look back at the Dow index, 57.8 puts us into a light hazard. So, this part of the flow sheet is not likely to cause us too much trouble from, uh, from a hazardous point of view. But it's, it's a very crude index. We haven't looked at any of the details of what would happen if butane's flow rate was to increase and then we get into that flammable region and what we would do. We haven't considered any of those transient conditions. We've only considered the normal operating conditions in this story index. I can really see how you calculate the point. Um, okay, so let's come back. Yeah, it's part of the minus two because these two points are two point seven five. Sorry, and then there's also uh, I I omitted here. Yeah, there's also a product of F3 with the uh, material factor. So the material factor. Sorry, yeah, good, good catch. Material factor for butane is twenty one. You look that up on the table. So then two point seven five is twenty one. That gets you. <laughs> So actually, that's interesting that if we were to take the same process but process a different hydrocarbon, that may push us over, over the limit because our material factors are changing. So very repeatable and consistent that any engineer could reproduce. So now let's uh, look at, at hazard, hazard studies. Um, I'll talk about this is a bit about this next part, but what I'd like to just do is uh, introduce some of this terminology here. And the thinking is we take nodes in our flow sheet. So a node, defining the node is a very specific part of the hazard and opportunity study. You do need to be very precise about it. A node is a very isolated part of the process. In this case, we refer to the the portion of pipe after the pump, after the split. It's very, it's that specific. Uh, you isolate it down to a very small, small region of the flow sheet. Um, or a node could be the split itself. Or if there was a valve over here, it could be the valve itself. Or the pump itself. So that defines our node. Then we consider a process. So we consider flow 
temperature, level, pressure, composition, operator action, sampling, for example, corrosion. These are parameters that we can consider based on that node. So what is the flow through that pipe? What is the temperature through that pipe? Level would not be an appropriate parameter to be using. It doesn't make sense for that. Uh, pressure, definitely. Composition, definitely. So we've got our node, firstly, we've got our parameters, secondly, and then we do a set of standard guide words. And we assume we know what the safe and typical operating condition is. And we're going to then look at our guide words relative to that the same position. So here's the here's the list of guide words, for example. If the pipe is after the pump is fitted as our node, our parameter is considered flow rate, then we'll look at our guide words. The, guide, the first guide word is less. So it simply implies less than the normal value. In other words, it's saying what is going to happen, what you expect to happen if the flow is less than the normal value. Then we'll look at cause, consequence, and action. We'll talk about that next time. We will do that, and then we'll go to our next guide word. So our, here was one guide word, less. Then we'll look at more. What is going to happen? What is the cause? consequence and action we should take if we see more than normal flow? Or what if we see no flow? What's going to be the anticipated consequences? What is going to be the consequence of reverse flow? So we will go through every guide word for every node, for every parameter, and we'll identify likely outcomes. You can quickly see how this gets to be a long procedure. Um, so we'll, we'll work through a case in our next class here on the fire detail, um, and we'll do that ourselves. We'll try those guys with four of those.